Perfect. Yep, that's good. Yeah, I'm so I, I've been doing still doing the zooms where you can't see anyone you're just looking at like this on your screen. It's just I it's like I'm talking to myself. Um, so I actually it's a pleasure to actually see faces. <laughs> um, uh, so all right, I'll go briefly through who the strike team is. So our, our goal is to protect natural lands through coordinated invasive strategic um, coordinated strategic invasive species management. Um, so at this point, we're, we're really the only entity that's sort of at the statewide level trying to be a hub um, of information gathering and redistributing. And um, the kind of things we do, we do mapping, data analysis and reporting. We do lots of outreach as well as training workshops. And you know the sort of nuts and bolts of, of it is um, searching and eradicating, uh, mainly as early detection and rapid response. So I'll go through like what I think the stewardship hierarchy is as far as when you do stewardship, where do you start with? Um, but as far as invasives go, once they become widespread, you know, it's just triage at one site or another. If you could prevent that spread or slow that spread down, um, that's a lot wiser way to spend very limited stewardship resources. I mean, and I mean, collectively, there's not nearly as much enough stewardship going on um, relative to the size of the problem. So with that in mind, you have to be as precise as you possibly can. So yeah, we have staff, we're all, it's a good crew of people, lots of knowledge in here, and um, we're all part-time. So we're mostly working off of grants and contracts. Um, we have a steering committee that helps us see the statewide picture and give us ideas about the things we can do or not do. And this is a very important list of people. This is our technical advisory committee. And this is what gives us, you know, the heft to have lists of species that people can trust because we have tons of experts contributing to that, including in this room currently. Um, uh, so um, yeah, th this, this is a really vital part of the strike team. I remember in the first early days of it, it was mostly me and maybe one other person. And it's like, I can guess about fish. I'm kind of a plant guy, but, but then let's get a fish person. Let's get a pest and pathogen person. Let's get real botanists. Um, not, you know, not just a plant ecologist pretending to be a botanist. That's technically my I am. So yeah, we got lots of good people that, uh, that help us um, um, understand invasive species, the full spectrum of them. Yeah. So uh, what is Phobos? Phobos is Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space. Oh, okay. So it's a long story, but um, that is a nonprofit, a local nonprofit in Mercer County. Okay. And um, they also house, they now house the strike team within it. So, uh, which still have retains its statewide um, uh, mission, but within the Friends of Hopewell Valley, it makes a lot of sense if I, Stop to explain all that. That's not the fun part. <laughs> um, but it actually has made the strike team uh, a lot more nimble and stronger by being nested under a nonprofit as opposed to being a separate nonprofit. Um, so what have we done so far since 2008? We've searched 800,000 of the 5 million acres in New Jersey. We've documented 25,000 populations and we've eradicated 7,000 of them. So, you know, what you find out year, year after year after you do this is this number gets bigger faster than this number. <laughs> so again, you have to be very targeted in what you're going after um, because you really can't keep up with the full realm of invasive species out there. You have to be as targeted as you can. So we have a, another US Forest Service grant. Um, this is a continuation from one we had three years prior. And it's working with a lot of private landowners, which is great. Um, and we're also working with all these partners. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of invasive species work and there's also tree planting by Sarah and Conservancy and work by New Jersey Audubon down in Cape May. Um, so, you know, it, uh, it's a very, it's a nice big grant and that'll keep us going for the next few years. Um, in addition to other work we have. 
Um, and these are some of our regular contracts, Essex County, Morris County, Jockey Hollow, and the municipality of Princeton. And, you know, we do lots of training and outreach. Um, obviously, COVID kind of totally blew things up for a little while. I mean, and then to be honest with you, I think we're still in recovery phase. Um, but we did end up reaching over 1,000 people last year. Um, this is something to, that I'd like to kind of call out um, whenever I give a presentation, um, volunteer stewardship teams. So these are people that it's kind of like the concept of adopt a park. And there are some amazing sets of volunteers out there, groups of volunteers that do outrageous amounts of work, um, all for free. Um, again, when you're doing invasive species management, you realize even if you counted every single conservation group stewardship efforts, it'd still be only a tiny fraction of the amount of work that needs to be done. So help, 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 um, you know, and, and these groups are great, you know, to some extent or another, we, we, we help when we can. Um, we have web resources up. We now have a Google map. So you can say, oh, this group is here. How far is that from my house? Should I join them? If you want to start one of your own, please let me know and I'll help you to the extent I can. And all of these people are, that are involved with these are super helpful. And again, they're on our website and contact information for all the people. Um, but it is, it is amazing what can get done. And it, you know, this is absolutely, you know, if you're doing invasive species management, you really should be inherently stubborn. Um, it's, it's really the only way. <laughs> um, you just have to be one of those people, no matter what the evidence is in front of you, you never stop going. Um, and that, that's absolutely what's required with uh, invasive species management. And there's lots of group, uh, lots of people doing stuff and we, we're trying to get that list to get bigger and bigger. Um, and these are just some of the things, you know, this is all on our website, so I won't spend too much more time on it, but, you know, a core of group leaders, regular work days every Saturday from nine to 12, one of the core people shows up and whoever else can plug in on that given day, but predictability, and a work plan where you could check boxes. You know, so if you say, well, my goal is to get rid of all the invasive species on this property, like eh, wrong goal. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get rid of all the invasive species between the yellow and blue trail. Okay, depending on how big that area is. Um, and, um, you know, so definitely having things you could check off and fun things too. Although I can kill plants for fun uh, till the day I die. Um, you know, it kind of helps when you plant native trees or wildflowers and things like that. It kind of spices it up and makes it more interesting for the volunteers. So yeah, there, there's a lot of good things in New Jersey. We are blessed as far as that goes. Um, yeah, so 2000 native species about, um, just all kinds of things. We have very variable underlying geology, which creates lots of, um, diversity for a small state, lots of things to celebrate. And the end, in the end, you're not killing invasive species to kill invasive species, you're killing invasive species to protect these. So it is just a matter of uh, perspective, lots of good stuff. I mean, we have a huge amount of the population of the federally listed bog turtle, a huge concentration of the globally rare Northern metal milk butterfly, timber rattlesnakes, bears, bobcats, all kinds of good stuff here. And, you know, ultimately the goal is to have systems that resist invasion, you know, and that's, that's really where the biggest gains could be gotten. Um, there'll always be a need for invasive control work, but we should have to fight so hard. Um, and we really should have forests that look more like this than sort of empty in the understory or totally infested in the understory. So there should be something basically from the ground level all the way up with all the layers of forest is supposed to have. So, you know, we still have over 50% natural cover in New Jersey. You know, that, that's something. Um, I've seen some of these uh, global initiatives that, you know, we should save 50% of the land area, you know, predominantly for natural cover. Um, and my response to that is that if you live in New Jersey, you know, that's not enough. It has to be higher than 50%. Because, you know, you can see in New Jersey, you get fragmentation when you get all this development over time. 
And yes, we have a lot of uh, good things going for us. But if I said, is New Jersey the ultimate model for global conservation? Like, no, 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 no. It has to be bigger than 50%. Because you have to account for all the impacts of all this development as they crush in their impacts on the, on the protected places. <clears throat> so yeah, the mess we've made. Um, obviously, habitat destruction. We fostered overabundant deer. We introduce invasive species, which are also encouraged by overabundant deer. Agricultural soil modifications really set the table for invasion. Fire regimes, Native Americans from 500 years back to 10,000 years back lit fires on a regular basis. It shaped all of the plants and animals we see now. And mostly that's gone. And to assume that that would have no effect would be silly. You know, thousands and thousands of years of a fire regime that has been mostly removed from the landscape. Stream flows, fragmentation, climate change. You know, obviously there's a lot of things weighing on our natural areas. So as far as the invasives go, the estimate is about 10,000 plant introductions. About a thousand of those are established in the flora. So that we brought them in and now they do their own thing without any more uh, human intervention. So, but the majority of these are not a problem. About 50 are now considered widespread invasive plants and there's about hundred emerging invasive plants. So 150 out of the original 10,000. So you have to ask why, what is it about these 150 that's different than the other 8,500, uh, you know what I mean. So I'm, I'm an ecologist, I don't do numbers. Um, a whole bunch of others that aren't invasive. So, you know, an invasive is introduced from an area outside its natural range, grows densely and excludes others, and then the, cat, the effects of that. So when you have overabundant deer, and I mean 10 plus times the amount of deer as there were um, 500 years ago, when there was about 10 deer per square mile, when you have 100 and 100 beyond deer per square mile, the non-native plants that are going to get through that sieve it, are going to be ones that deer don't eat. Just straight up, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then they have, you know, characteristics of a weed otherwise, generally. They can tolerate a wide conditions of light and soil. They mature quickly and produce lots of seeds. So things just in the numbers game of populations. If you think of a, a plant that's is going from essentially nothing growing in some yards and then be form wild populations the odds of that for any plant are really low you know it's and and, and it takes a long time for populations to get rolling on uh, these self-sustaining and vigorous you know deer not eating them is huge and then having these weedy characteristics is essential without both of these like this is one set of things and that's another it has to have both things going for it so, you know, I always get the question, why are invasives bad? Um, plants are not bad, all plants are good. People, uh, plants, <laughs> plants, they're all good. Um, and, and basically it's a broken food web. Um, so this is just one example. So on the top line in white is autumn olive. So when a field gets abandoned, um, you would normally, you know, 50 years ago, it would go through a succession involving, this is a tiny subset, of plants that you might find in an old abandoned field. Now, more or less, all you get is autumn olive and very small numbers of representatives of other species. And I chose autumn olive because out of all the invasives, it's one that comes to mind as having, you know, interaction with the rest of the food web at some level. So it makes flowers in May that are wildly attractive to bees. It makes fruit in September and October that are wildly attractive from everything from chickadees to bears. Um, before I killed all the autumn olive on my property at home, I'd go out at night when they were, the fruit were ripe and I'd hear cracky branches really loud. A bear would come and take, pull the branches down to eat the fruit. So they obviously have some value. Okay, well, that's great. Um, so if I'm a bee, Look at all the different months there's flowers when you have this diversity of native plants versus this one. I don't know about you, but 
If I were B, I would like to eat every single month, not just one month. So, you know, you have this, this um, skewing of the food web. And again, I'm choosing an invasive that probably has the most value as I can imagine. And it just, you can't say that that replaces this. Same thing with the fruit. Fruit here cannot replace the fruit and flowers and seeds across the entire year. So basically it throws things off. That came out a little too light. Um, but one of the other attributes of many invasives is not only do deer not eat them, they don't have a lot of insects eating their leaves either. So insects are eating the leaves of all these things and then they feed birds. Perfect. If you don't have insects eating the leaves of the olive, then there's less bugs, less birds. So there's been a documented loss of 30% of the overall bird population in the last 50 years. There's been somewhere in that range, 20 to 30% of insect population loss in the last 50 years. Um, it's that bad. <laughs> you know, I'm not, there's no way to sugarcoat that. It's just horrendous. And it's like, a 30 alarm fire, a thousand, a million alarm fire. Obviously the system is crashing. Um, and it's just only a matter of our perception of what's, what's missing and the fact that, you know, you might lose a little percent one year, a little percent the next year. So in a human perspective, it's a little less perceptible, but if you can go back in time in 50 year chunks, you'd be like, holy crap, <laughs> you know, look what we lost. Um, so, you know, we're in this sort of slow motion from our point of view and lightning quick from nature's point of view transformation. Um, invasive species are part of the problem along with all those other things that I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bad, it's a, it's a bad. Um, it's definitely a problem. Um, and then tying the deer in, so pre-European, the estimate was 10 deer per square mile. In 1900, there were no deer in New Jersey or very few because of unregulated market hunting. So you could sell the deer that you harvested. Good motivating factor for humans. There hasn't been a species we can't try to extinction if there's money involved. Um, so we did, you know, and we say, hey, well, that's a problem. Deer are part of the system, agreed. Um, you know, from 1900 to 1972, there was a massive effort to increase the deer population. And they got back to where it was in the old, old days. Great. Then poof, it took off like a rocket. So that exponential growth of populations kicked in right around this time. Coincidentally, that 50-ish year time period overlapping with the decline of birds and insects, the rise of deer and the rise of invasives. It kind of adds up. Um, not that there weren't other, there are other things going on that of course there are, but it is a bit of a coincidence. If you look at flora, you know, um, uh, surveys of flora, you know, from the fifties, the only real invasive mentioned in a regular way is Japanese honeysuckle. And now we have a hundred, uh, 50 widespread and a hundred emerging species since 1950. 1950 seems like a long time ago, not from nature's point of view. <laughs> that's that's not even a blink of an eye from nature's point of view so it's changing extremely quickly even things we think of as everywhere and they're quite abundant still grass and barberry that didn't really start kicking in until the 80s so again even a shorter time period from the, from there 30 years later we're getting stuff that are extremely abundant now but 1980 isn't really that long ago in the scheme of things so, you know, there's definitely a, a hand in glove thing going on here. So again, like 10 feet per square mile is the historical and there's some research for all these things that say that's where you break the Lyme disease cycle. That's where you get much more negligible amounts of deer vehicle collisions. And there was research where they had enclosures with deer in them at different densities. Above 10 is when you started to get uh, noticeable degradation of the forest. So um, 10 does seem to be the magic number. Um, and this is just some of the data from uh, Hopewell Township where we do nighttime deer counts every year. If you're wondering why it was low in 2012, that was a really bad year for blue tongue or EHD, a disease that hurts them. But within you know, a couple of years, they were back over 80. Another couple of years, they were back over 100. 
So they, they just have an incredible ability to bounce back. Um, that was also, that was a smaller blue tongue outbreak. And we did, I don't have 2023 on here. We just did it a few weeks ago. It is back up to 90. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, so this, this, this uh, decline, decline of, of the amount of beer because of diseases? In, in these two cases, it was blue tongue with disease. Yes, it was disease. So, so that, that's, that's also what, what affected the, 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 the crash of the before. Uh, these are just blips as far as that goes, as far as that time frame goes. Whoops. Yeah, I mean, this one is even from 2019, but yeah, around 100 is where the stable point is, so to speak, is in Hopewell. Um, and these little blips, that's a year by year. So that, that's, 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 all, that's only, only Hopewell Township in New Jersey. Oh, Township, yeah, yeah. Yes, only that spot. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We do nighttime deer counts at the end of March. You freeze your butt off. You have spotlights and you run it through the data through a formula and it says deer per square mile. Um, but it's um, it's forty thousand acres. It takes us, you know, three nights to do that. So you can only do it so much. There are people doing now um, nighttime infrared camera drone stuff. And you could definitely cover a lot more ground faster that way. Um, but yeah, the, these sort of ups and downs, even as strong as they are from 40-ish to 100-ish, that's sort of a blip in that overall picture I showed you before. The number is very high and, and is uh, with minor variations from blue tongue, it stays around that 100 mark. Um, yeah. It's the explosion basically that <laughs> Into no, there's more deer than there ever were. So, well, here, yeah, well, this uh, this will be your answer. So, in Hopewell, these are the forest areas. Deer love forest edges. All these beige areas are residential development and farm farmland. If I were a deer and I had a choice between soybean leaves and an oak leaf filled with tannins that are hard to digest, I bet you I can gain more weed eating soybean leaves. So we're giving them a very rich diet, plentiful rich diet. And the amount of space our house is taken up is negligible for them. They're getting so much food and so much protection because you can't hunt where there's houses. So, you know, you, we're basically, we've made it absolutely perfect for them. Excellent deer habitat, not enough deer management. And they've caused all these problems because their population has boomed. So it isn't a matter of, well, we took all the deer from the natural areas and we squeezed them into much fewer natural areas. That's not it at all. There's actually way, way more deer than there ever were when it was all natural. If this were all forest, you would probably have 10 deer per square mile because they wouldn't have as much good food to eat. Now, what about like the residential? I mean, we're in the town so residential that it's overrun. Well, I wouldn't say overrun the deer, but I mean, I live in a neighborhood that's very residential. I mean, yep. you know, we have small houses, but we have a little bit of, we have a, a golf course a little down like, but this is hard. Yeah. And, and yeah. they, you know, in the winter, when they lack food, they come up and eat our truck. Sure. I wish they would go out to my edges, but they Yeah, trim them, them nice for you if you get ready for spring. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, like I said, there's definitely more deer than there would be without the development um, because forests aren't that friendly to them as opposed to what the residential neighborhoods and farmland. Like, you know, I, to me, the lesson that I learned, like I did um, work at South Mountain Reservation pretty early on when I was doing this, starting this kind of stuff. I'm like, there's no farmland. Um, it's 2000 acres surrounded by dense development. You know, and the forest is completely stripped bare. There's barely anything left to eat. How are they alive? Well, all the yards, that's how they're alive. You know, and the forest just becomes a supplemental food. It's not a nearly enough to, with, with, to support a herd of that size. So they're eating elsewhere and then they retreat to the forest for whatever reasons, get a couple of bites of anything that did pop up. Um, but yeah, we're, we're supporting them in our 
manufactured landscape, farms and, and uh, homes. Um, and yeah, it's a matter of, it's, it's hard to, to manage deer. It's not impossible if we all pushed in the same direction. Um, like I said, when we want to, we can kill anything. We're humans, damn it. Um, so if we decided, but there's so many cross currents that prevent deer management from happening. If anyone wants to see, we tortured ourselves. Um, I'll give the link out, but um, it was basically called the deer stakeholder slides. And it's all different groups of people and things they, they could do that would help reduce the deer and things that don't help reduce the deer. And you start to see, if you look at it, you see all the different interests of all the different groups, all working in a way that makes it so you can't win, so to speak. There has to be a lot more um, coordination and, and courage to, to go after deer. Someone asked me one time, like, well, can we actually reduce the deer population? I'm like, I don't know. When I do my deer counts, they gather in March, they're gathering in fields. Like you could find 50 of them in one spot. Not to sound harsh, but I'm going to sound harsh. Get up in a helicopter and shoot all 50 of them. It would work. Why don't we do it? Because collectively, we don't have the courage and don't want to put the money into doing it. On the other hand, there's 500 deer vehicle collisions a year in Hopewell, times that by 500 in deductibles. That's a large sum of money that we're paying silently. What about our, our premiums? That's all worked into the premiums too, because they're not losing. When you pay a 500 deductible and it's $4,000 worth of work, well, they got that from your premium, which was artificially raised because of deer vehicle collisions. So it's silently, we're paying for all this. Um, and if we don't want that to be the case, we have to um, work together a little bit more. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of impacts. So we, we could say whether we want to um, go for it or just let the status quo be and pay for it silently. Um, that is the choice. Um, so, you know, when you, how do you lose a forest? So a forest, yeah, gaps open up, trees die, they get hit by lightning, whatever. In the old days, when there were 10 deer per square mile, you might have an oak tree this big, 30 years old, five foot tall, because there weren't deer that were going to constantly chomp it to the ground when it was low. When that happened, that thing had, that little skinny little tree had enough root under it that as soon as the light hit it, it just went poof. The ecologists call it advanced regeneration. So it's regeneration waiting in advance for something to happen. And when, when there were low amounts of deer, it would fill in. Now all you get is invasive plants that deer don't eat in canopy gaps. So gap by gap by gap, it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, when you get, go on the ground, that's a spice bush seedling. That's a tulip poplar seedling. If we get out of nature's way, and by that I mean we lower the deer herd back to closer to what it's supposed to be, it'll heal itself. We just got to get out of the dang way. Um, so, you know, those mature trees and mature shrubs that are out of the way of the browse line, they're making their fruit, they're trying, but there's too many deer for them to succeed uh, and replace the other trees and shrubs that are uh, missing. So, you know, this is what we want. In areas without an agricultural land use history, often you get an empty forest. And there's certainly portions here that are, that are very much like this. And then where you've had past land use with agriculture, the soil is kind of messed up from a forest perspective. And it just becomes this horrendous mess of invasive vines and shrubs and things like that. How do invasive species actually get there? I mean, invasive almost sounds like it's so much seeds that they're not supposed to, but I'm sure that's not the case. I mean, they're spreading by, depending on the plant, they might have berries that a bird will carry or seeds that get blown around by the wind. So like decorative plants? Yeah. Yeah. The yep. Like I mean, about 50% uh, about of the invasive plants are purposely introduced toward a cultural plants that spread. And then the other 50 are accidental things like still grass before styrofoam peanuts and better options. Um, still grass was used as a packing material. So when you got to the port, you unpacked your still grass, got your fine China out from China, and you know, um, still grass 
spread. Mile a minute came from contaminated holly seeds. Um, <laughs> he's like, stop with the bad news already. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, accidental and purposeful, uh, depending. Um, so emerging invasives are things that have the potential to become widespread. And again, that's what we try with the strike team to focus on. Um, what we also do, so out of the total uh, 99 plants, uh, on our target list, there are some 45 things that are not animal, uh, not plants. And every species we put a stage level on. So it's meant to prioritize. The idea is if you're at stage zero, you have less than 10 known populations in the state. So if you have one of these plants on your property, that really needs to be your number one priority because you have not only responsibility for your site, you have sort of a regional responsibility to not allow a new species to spread from your site to other people's sites. Stage one is like 11 to 100 populations, you get the gist. So these would be the higher priority. These are, once you've gotten here, there's probably no chance in heck you're gonna contain it. Even this is a little shaky depending. Um, but you know, you, you basically wanna prioritize your work by how far out of the box these invasives are. So sickle weed, um, I'll quickly tell you a story of this one because I'm so happy about it. Um, so, because the strike team existed, someone knew I could tell someone about this weird plant I just found. So someone at White Lake was doing work there, stewardship work, and they found this plant they had already identified and said it was sickle weed. And they're like, have you ever heard of this? I'm like, nope. <laughs> so quick Google search, you're like, oh, it's a major pest in, in rangelands and such, you know, Midwest to West. Like, you know, why on God's green earth would I let that stand? It was this patch that I can kill. I live 20 minutes away. You know, I drove over and I killed it with herbicide. If I didn't, it might've spread across that entire site, might've got spread to other sites. Early detection, rapid response. If you have a clue that this thing is going to be invasive and there's only one known of it, well, kill it. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, so, you know, that, that is in an ideal situation where you actually could do something about it. And, and be honest with you, that's the only story I have like that. So I keep telling it over and over again. Um, but, you know, ideally, that's how it goes. Um, so, yeah, there's others that are a little more out of the box. But whenever we get the opportunity to kill them, we do. Um, but uh, and there were two sites that we did treat it. Um, but I'm sure there's some more that we don't know about. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what early detection rapid response is all about. Do you, do you ever get any objection to, you know, kill certain plants as a nice looking shrub or whatever? I'll, get, I'll definitely get to that. I'll <laughs> definitely get to that because it is one of my pet peeves, so I won't forget that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, well, a pesticide is a generic term for anything that kills anything else. Herbicide is a name for a, a, a chemical that kills plants. Oh. So it's just a subset of. Um, and yeah, I mean, there is definitely a learning curve for certain plants on how best to kill them. Um, the glee I take, my boss has referred to me as Dr. Death um, because of the glee I have when I figure out how to kill something the most efficiently. Um, but yeah, there's, there's different types of herbicides and you can, you know, with experience, you can say, I think this would work on a plant like that. You know, it's an annual, a biennial, a perennial that's short lived, long lived, you know, you can kind of get the feeling for it, but you still, there's some level of trial and error if someone hasn't tried to do it in the past. Plus, you know, one of the people on our technical committee is Art Gover, who's the absolute weed guru from Penn State. So my first stop is, when in doubt, call Art. <laughs> um, so, you know, you try to find the most effective, efficient way to, to get rid of something. Is, are these herbicides commercially available? Yeah, yeah, they're all, they're all things that are kind of off the shelf. Yeah, I should have 
sure you wrote the story about the Roundup, but yeah. it's a whole big deal about yeah. cancer protocol. And we could talk about that in depth. Um, you know, I, um, what I could say is we use, we use glyphosate and we use it in the most effective, efficient manner we possibly can. Um, it doesn't get into groundwater. I mean, we could spend hours just talking about this and we could, but um, Things to consider are spraying a patch of a weed in the woods versus spraying your food five times in a year and then eating it. So just little, just one distinction to make right off the bat. It doesn't get into groundwater. That's another distinction for some other past herbicides and bad things from the past. Um, I mean, shoot, I, I studied for my pesticide exam and the books to study for it are like 30, 40 years old. <laughs> and they're talking about using arsenic-based chemicals. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's dumb. They, they sit there forever. <laughs> it's a metal-based thing. It's very bad. You know, the, the modern herbicides and for whatever attributes they have that might be bad, they're definitely better than the old school stuff. Um, I'm not saying as an, an as a... Um, you know, justifying the decision now to use what I'm using now, but the decision is essentially, this is a more benign option for nature than doing nothing and letting these invasive species run amok. The damage done by the invasive species needs to be considered. Um, and that's our decision. And that's, that's how we roll. And if you don't, that's fine. Don't use herbicides. That's fine. I, I'm not, you know, everyone makes their own decisions. Um, and this is another case of an early detection rapid response. It wasn't getting rid of a species, an only known occurrence in the state, but this is one Chinese silver grass in an otherwise diverse wet meadow in Hopewell. The decision's pretty simple. Do I wait for this and wine, or do I go out there and spend 10 minutes killing the one plant? So, you know, all the restoration science we could use and whatever, you know, we can come up with, we can't take this and make it bad again. We're not that good. You prevent the damage as opposed to try to repair it. Um, and again, and, that, and that's another sort of how much herbicide that I use to kill this plant versus not recognizing the problem and getting to this and trying to kill all these. You know, it's dropped of herbicide here versus this. So again, that, that's sort of the level of responsibility I feel when I use herbicides. Yeah, I mean, I haven't personally studied them, <laughs> but, but um, yeah, we use glyphosate and triclopyr most often out of the herbicides that are out there. That's what we use most often is glyphosate and triclopyr. Um, and yeah, like I said, the, the decision is made that you doing this is much less bad than letting the invasives go amok. And that's why, you know, when you're doing invasive control work, that's where I feel the obligation. Like, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't a, a berry picking tree hugging hippie turned into this to go kill a bunch of, you know, spray a bunch of toxic chemicals around. I, I came to the decision to spray herbicides because I saw it as the better option versus doing nothing and letting invasives run amok and destroy the system that way. So, you know, that, that again, that's a decision um, that everyone would have to make on their own. Um, I kind of spoke about this enough, I think I'll just move on. And here, here's the, what I consider the stewardship effort hierarchy. Deer, if you reduce the deer population, native plants will be able to compete again. If you go to deer exclosures that have been around a while, if you go to places with very good deer management, I'll show you some pictures from Duke Farms, you realize that, you know, there's a joke with between ecologists and hunters, what's the best herbicide? A bullet, shooting deer, harsh, I get it. Um, but that's the reality. If we allow the system, if we allow native plants to actually compete they were here for thousands and thousands of years. You think they're not competitive? Of course they're competitive. They just can't get eaten all the time while their competition doesn't get eaten. 
that isn't competition one versus one. That's, you know, I used to always tell the joke, I haven't done this in a while. Like I could beat the fastest man in the world in a foot race if you tie his legs together. You know, so that's exactly what's happening. You know, the invasive plant isn't necessarily faster or more competitive. It just doesn't get eaten and the native plants do. So if you reduce the deer population, again, say, say you don't, you, you think herbicides are the worst thing in the world ever, well then support good deer management because that, that's even a much better way than using herbicides ultimately. Um, so deer management, invasives, and when you do invasives, start from the stage zeros and work your way up. Um, and then if you have high conservation value areas, and by that I mean the best spot on the piece of land you're interested in, this place with the least amount of invasives, make it close to zero and then try to spread out, you know, expand that area of goodness. Um, so be as, as um, strategic as you possibly can. If you go into a site and you go, that 20 acres on the north part of my preserve is 100% barberry, that's where I got to start. That's the last place to go. You know, get, keep the clean places clean and expand them and get rid of any emerging ones. You might not ever get to that barberry. And that's fine. Um, so be very strategic. And I'll spare you all of these because a statistician that I don't, I could barely understand it to read it. So um, I'm like, hmm, how about, how about this? <laughs> so I suggest it. Why don't we talk about the ratio of native to invasive species and see how that changed over time? So within the deer exposure, the ratio of native to non native went from 1.1 to 1.4. That seems small in numbers. That's a huge difference. That's a huge difference over 15 years, 10 to 15 years. So you keep that going and you see what happens. The natives start to dominate over the invasives when you've removed deer. And the undefensed areas where they just have a really good deer management, it started out a lot worse, but it is also getting significantly better. So the, we have to say, you know, oh, you wanna go back to 1492, like, I'd love to. Um, I mean, I'd probably wet myself if I were transported into a forest in 1492. It would be so freaking amazing. <laughs> um, probably would be a puddle underneath because I would wet myself. But that's not, not what we're going for. We're never going to get that. You know, my, my regular quip back to people who are doing that because they're obviously trying to be jerks to me is to say, I'd be happy if we're 1992. It's getting so bad so fast that 1992 would be dramatically better than what we have now. So, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. Nosing up the proportion of native to non-native cover is modest, but that's what we should expect to see when we're doing everything as right as we can. Get more native cover relative to non-native cover. And, you know, you look in the forest at Duke Farms and you see all these hickory seedlings growing up, maple seedlings. It's just amazing. You know, your, 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 your faith in nature is restored. It didn't forget how to work. We have to get out of the way. That, that's the bottom line, get out of the way. Um, and the biggest way we get in the way is by allowing there to be an outrageously oversized deer herd. Still grass, nothing grows through still grass except for hickory seedlings and a whole bunch of other things. Get out of the way. And all of a sudden it starts to heal itself. Um, so it is amazing, amazing to see. Um, this is a Where's Waldo for plants. There's a little bit of barberry that you can see getting smothered to death by native regrowth. So yeah, barberry is not indestructible. Barberry is an invasive species. A really bad invasive, yeah. But when you take deer out of the picture or reduce the deer, the native plants outcompete it and it just smothers it. A bunch of things here. Oh, okay. um, there's ash and oak and a bunch of other things in here. Okay, so um, like a, bunch of a bunch of, yeah, different native trees and shrubs. Yeah, it's not just one thing that can do it. Right. Pretty much all of them can. Um, same thing, you know, here, this is, yeah, it's hard to tell from the picture, but there's, there's ash and hickory and there's definitely oaks. Oak. Um, same thing, like, I always show like, I, I, I went to, I got a graduate degree in ecology and spent years and years getting it. It turns out the taller plant wins. 
Very, very complicated. Let me read it. Um, that, that's what it comes down to. Too short, tall, tall winds. Very complicated, very complicated. Um, so control methods, we're going, is it seven o'clock we're going to? Okay, I, I think I'll, I'll go through this, but I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, the first thing as far as control is um, stop making it worse. And there's current legislation being proposed to have regulated invasive uh, list of invasives in New Jersey. We are one of just a few states left in the country that has no list. Um, so embarrassing. Um, so we've, for years, we've had our do not plant list, which is, you know, obviously voluntary. But if you want to not contribute to making it worse, take a look at our list. When you're doing your shopping, avoid the species on this list. There's many more to choose from. Um, lots of native plants, lots of even non-native plants that aren't invasive. Um, this looks like a lot, um, but relative to the amount of plants that are available, it's a tiny amount. Um, I kind of beat this pretty good, but ecological control, meaning reduce the deer herd is the best way to get rid of deer. There's obviously herbicides, mechanical control, biological control, um, but this is, the, this is the holy grail, is having a lower deer herd so native plants can actually compete. And if you're a homeowner, frighteningly enough, with no training and no knowledge whatsoever, you can go on Amazon and get whatever the hell you want. Um, so if you buy a concentrate, um, uh, of herbicide, a concentrate bottle, please follow the directions and dilute it. <laughs> More is not necessary. When it says you need a 3% solution of spray to kill your dandelions, don't say, well, my bottle's 50%. That's way better. It'll kill it way faster. <laughs> you know, again, don't, don't do that. Um, when you apply herbicides, not on your own property, that's when you have to be a certified applicator, take tests and get trained and all that stuff. Um, you know, we, I talked about glyphosate and triclopyr, the two we use most often. You know, just a lot of this stuff is common sense. You don't spray up because then the spray goes everywhere, including on your head. Um, so, you know, when you spray, you do this, spray down. So you only hit the things that you want to hit and you don't get this sort of mist spreading everywhere. Um, if you want to be more precise, usually you have to do more work, like cutting down this thing so that you can apply herbicide just to cut stump. Um, most people that start or really feel not awesome about using herbicides, but have a little, there's a little bit of possibility, this is the one that they say, okay, I could do that. <laughs> because you're literally just dabbing it right onto the, the stem and it feels safer and it is safer and you're only hitting the thing you want to hit. Um, that's how I look when I'm going to feel a little happy. <laughs> that was the beginning of the work that. <laughs> um, another method is spraying the bark. Again, it's very directed um, basal bark method. Um, these get a little more intensive, hack and squirt. Um, we have this on our website for anyone who's interested in using herbicides. Again, most of this is from Art Gover at Penn State. I should probably, probably making everyone seasick by keep hitting the screen like that. Um, but we have this on our website. You could download it. Every single species has these codes next to it as to what's the best way to kill it. And then you say, oh, okay, I wanna use FS3. All right, well, that's 5% glyphosate. There's an accompanying table that says how many ounces of the bottle of concentrate you add to the water. So you're not like, oh, more will be better. Like, no, no, just follow these. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, more is not necessarily better. Um, but you don't want to use too little because that's the worst case scenario in my mind is you use too little. Now you've put the herbicide out there and it didn't do anything. Like that's the worst of all situations. Every year we train seasonal interns. Every year you say, okay, spray the plant and make sure all the leaves are wet. And they spray it and like half the leaves are wet. And they're like, okay, then I'm going to go on because they don't really want to do it. And I get it. I don't really want to do it either. I'm just hard and nasty at this point. So you're just like wet all the leaves. <laughs> you know, that's what you have to do. If you wet half the leaves, you didn't kill the plant and you used herbicide. 
Like, how is that a better solution, a better option? Um, so you want to do it as right as you possibly can and use the right mixtures and the right herbicides on the plants um, to effectively get rid of them. Okay, so, um, all right, so the your question from earlier, calorie pair, pretty beautiful. Um, whole fields could be covered with calorie pair. What would be wrong with thousands of them? If one's pretty, thousands are thousand times prettier. So my only response to that is, it's not just about us. You know, I think in the shortest amount of words, it isn't just what's pretty to our eye that's valuable. So this has the same problems as a whole field cover with autumn olive, actually worse because the fruit are worse than, autumn, than, than uh, olive fruit. So it looks great for in April and it's undeniably beautiful and a whole field of it is truly beautiful, but that's just us and our perceptions of it. If I were a bee, I would be flipping you to bird. <laughs> That's pretty fun. <funny. laughs> um, um, you know, they're like, well, yeah, that's great. Uh, what do I do the rest of the year? I starve to death. Are you happy now? You thought it was so pretty in April. I'm starving to death. Are you happy about that? You know, be with attitude like a New Jersey thing. Um, you know, so, um, you know, that's the bottom line of it. It can't just be about our perception of what we enjoy. You know, there, if, without the, un, the full understanding of what does it mean to have an entire field filled with that as opposed to 50 different native species, really adding to the food web complexity. So, I mean, that, to me, that's the bottom line and it's, it's, it's a value decision. I'm not, you know, I can't deny that when someone says that's beautiful, that it isn't. I've heard people do that with invasives and it blows my mind. Like, that's not beautiful. Like, are you sure? <laughs> that looks pretty beautiful to me. <laughs> I'm not saying I want it, but I can't deny <laughs> the obvious. Um, but yeah, it, it, the, the bottom line is it can't just be about us. Um, we're one, we are not separate from nature. We are part of nature, absolutely. That whole philosophical argument, but it can't just be about us or it leads us down the road to where we are now in 50 years, you lose 30% of your birds. What happens in the next 50? You know, so, you know, we have to be thinking more broadly about, you know, overall ecological health. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's the sort of soapbox rendition of, of, of that argument. Um, Japanese Aurelia, you know, I talked about stage levels. Uh, and go after the stage levels that are lower. Well, Japanese Aurelia, if you're in Essex County, is absolutely widespread bonkers. If you go down the Hope Well, there's very little. So it might be stage zero in Hope Well and, and widespread in Essex County. So depending on where you are in the state, you might have a different reaction to it. So in Hope Well, I have to remember to tell Beth, I found another population along a roadside in Hope Well. Um, a week or so ago, and we will knock on people's doors and say, there's this weird invasive plant, da, 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 da. they look at you funny. <laughs> and then you say, can we kill it? And they're like, okay. Like if you kind of present it in a certain way and you know, you more or less seem harmless, <laughs> um, they'll let you on their property. So that's what we do in Hopewell. In Essex County, I would, that would be silly. There's thousands and thousands of locations. So it's, it's too late there. Japanese maple, this is another one that falls into that argument. God, this is probably one of the most beautiful trees that I could think of. I love the way it looks. Um, and the story I have on this, we found some seedlings. If there's are, there are populations where there's whole chunks of forest, especially near um, within neighborhoods that have a lot of Japanese maple. You find isolated individual seedlings throughout forests in different places. Um, I'd, I'd like to, I'm not going trying to pick fights. Um, I don't say something is going to be invasive just because I want to aggravate people. Um, this is actually becoming an invasive species. And um, if we continue to grow it and allow it to spread, it's going to become an in, uh, a full-blown widespread invasive someday. I, okay. Yep. Just, well, it is, I mean, yep. it's like, I don't have a big thumbs up. Anything that no skin in the game, yeah. <laughs> a few years ago, uh, we had a couple of Japanese maples 
self-control. Yep. And so it's like, oh, we go to a nursery, we have like three hundred dollars. Yeah. The tree and everything. Yeah. So we just let it grow. Okay. It's not overwhelming, but yeah. is it? It also can spread. Yeah. Like, you know, other neighbors, and we right. don't know how it actually got there. We just all of a sudden. Oh, we we live on a corner, so it, it doesn't really have much place to just end the like yeah, trees are on that corner. I mean, so I mean, should I, I mean the seeds I don't know. The seeds so, blow in the wind, yeah, so, so yeah. It's so yeah. small enough that it could actually cut down the field. You so, could, you so, could. You know that it's fully in our head this time too. It's fully what? Like right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the job just got bigger. <laughs> Done and done. Yep. We planted a Japanese maple. Right? Yeah. yeah. It lasted about thirty years. And okay. Kind of spread over some country. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, these these get planted all the time. I I do. Um, we have a project called Community Conservation down in Hopewell, and I will visit uh, members' yards and make recommendations about natives and talk about invasives, yada, yada. And I don't think I've, there's like 300 people in the program now. I don't think I've been the one that didn't have some invasive plants planted in their landscape. They're invasive because they, they're, they were widely given, you know, suggested. And people said, oh yeah, I want a beautiful tree. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I not want it? No, I want an ugly tree. <laughs> What's that? Um, I mean, the weeping, he weeping cher cherry is becoming invasive for sure. I'm not sure which one that is. Do you well, Kwanzaa cherry? The one with the pink. There are two, Sirinulata oh, okay. and Gator Okay. Or both. Ah. And it, it's hard to tell them apart. But any, any cherry that can be fruit. Well, these are not, these, these are just the flower and pink ones you see in water. Yes. Yeah. And and you know it's funny because there when I what I learned quickly with doing that program and talking to lots of private landowners because the the funny not so funny sorry so I'm telling this late and I think it was Japanese maple so I'm talking to this woman and I'm like yeah and this Japanese maple and that's like as the words are coming out of my mouth is in <laughs> she's like. That tree, we, we planted that in memory of my grandmother. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna just put those words back on the wall. <laughs> That's beautiful, yeah. Like, you know, you, you have to sort of know what the limits are. So normally what I'll say at this point is, I, I sometimes I just skip over some of the invasives in people's yards. It's about moving forward, you know? And if you take that sort of tact, it's a lot less resistance. If you just say moving forward, we have a do not plant list. Don't pick anything on that list for new stuff and just leave it at that. Are these different species with uh, different names? Different varieties, cultivars, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've seen the green and red, not with all the dissection and stuff, but I've seen both of these in forests. Yeah. And like I said, you know, there's in the scheme of things, um, in the scheme of things, moving forward and not selecting invasives is a huge win. And going backwards in time, yeah, sure, if you want to, if you're doing a whole redo of your landscape or something, that's sure, cut, get rid of the invasives too. But at the very least, you know, like in my mind, it's stop making it worse, so to speak. Stop continuing to buy invasives. Yeah. Thinking about the beginning of like thinking about stewardship. Yeah. And um, in my mind, I've had like this sort of idea of like a diagram rather than like actually invasive. Like I had my existing plants out there that was invasive. Yeah. But then there's the other plants that are not there. In my mind, or actually in my studio, it's like native invasives, like poison ivy. So like okay. I was just curious yeah. about are those like uh, just like you know. Obviously, if it's, you know, if there's mild limit, you can go into it, but then there's like things like that. Sure. And by, by definition, 
invasive is a non-native. Oh, okay. Just, just it's a bit semantics. You could have weedy native, but by definition, you can't call it invasive. So I mean, technically, it technically, it's yeah. It's yeah. Now, on the same token, if you had a trellis right next to your front door and poison ivy started growing on it, I would probably kill it if it were my trellis next to my front door. <laughs> you know, just because I don't want to get wiped across my face as I'm opening my door. Um, so yeah, I mean, grapes are another example. I've been sort of doing this restoration work on my own property. And the first thing I had to do was get the grapes that were dragging down all my trees. They're native, but I'm not going to let them kill every single tree while the emerald ash borer kills all my ashes. You know, so, you know, you, you, on, there are situations where you may have to control native plants in, in your conservation efforts. Yes. And it'll typically be those very weedy ones. Goldenrod is a great example too of a weedy native. So in a post-agricultural soil that's been highly altered and favors invasives, it also favors certain weedy natives. You know, I look at a field of goldenrod, the first thing I say is, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, um, the second thing is it does get a lot of pollinator use and there's galls and all those things that live in a gall, I mean, all good things. But at the same time, I've, I've had to manage meadows at my house that became all goldenrod. Yes, the really aggressive ones, Canada and rough leaves, that they're they're pretty aggressive. Like gray goldenrod, if you're gonna use a goldenrod, stick with gray or um, in a forest, stick with um, wreath goldenrod. Which one? Seaside is a good one. I love zigzag goldenrod personally. Um, they do form a mat, but not in the same way as like Canada does in the sun. Or, um, so yeah, you have to, there, there are cases where you might have to uh, manage native plants um, that are very aggressive. Um, I'm gonna blow by through some of these. Again, these are, if anyone wants the um, uh, slides and stuff, I'm glad to give a link to them. Um, tree of Heaven is the tree that grew in Brooklyn. One of the, just after, Japanese honeysuckle was tree of heaven in the list of things that started to show themselves as invasive. Yeah, now I, irony. Uh, I love irony. Yeah, and the, the spotter and lanternflies seem to love the tree of heaven. Um, these are ones again. So when I mentioned, you know, how the, the barberry got swarmed over by natives, there's a group of invasives that are also very tall and aggressive. And even in low deer numbers, they would be competitive against our taller understory native trees. So in my mind, people say, well, which ones do you think are the worst? Well, they all stink. <laughs> but um, as far as forests go, I worry about these tall, shade tolerant invasives like common buckthorn. Um, glossy buckthorn is also a serious problem, especially in wetter areas. Barberry. Jet beat is up and coming. This one had a huge lag time, like decades, and now it seems to be breaking out of the box quickly. Jet beat. I think I pressed the wrong button. Yeah, jet beat. Uh, linden viburnum is also on that list of tall, aggressive invasives that are different than the invasives we've had to date. Um, so linden viburnum is high on my list when I'm managing a forest. Multiflora rose uh, was given out by the millions by U.S. Department of Agriculture in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, it is now succumbing to rose rosette disease in sunny places only, not in shaded areas. Oriental photinia is on that list. So common buckthorn, oriental photinia, linden viburnum, Siebel's viburnum. These are ones that even if deer numbers were low, they would still be a problem. And they're still available commercially. Yes, and hopefully, I can't remember what's gonna be on the list if the legislation is passed in New Jersey, but I believe all four of those are on the list. Um, so that's good, that's good. Um, in here, Seabolt, I burn. So that, that's other, other one, the other huge problem. So and one last sort of kind of point, I guess, is something called, um, recently there was work done by uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, Eve Bury, um, Bethany Bradley, others, 
Um, and they defined uh, a term called climate sleepers. So these are things that are here in a particular location and they haven't been invasive because the climate hasn't been optimal for that. So English ivy is a great example. So this has been planted for a couple hundred years, <laughs> you know, and never showed any sign of being invasive until the last 20 or so maybe. Um, and starting from South Jersey, moving to North Jersey. So if you go to Cape May, even as far north as Bordentown, I've seen entire forest floors just covered with English ivy up every tree and they will destroy the tallest tree. So this sort of benign thing that was here a really long time, all of a sudden it's become an invasive. And the, the likely answer, although I have, I have a proof, so to speak, is just that window of growth season got bigger. So I remember 20 plus years ago, not seeing ripe fruit on, on English ivy. It would flower later in the year. It would try to set fruit, but it would get frozen off and never make mature fruit so that birds couldn't eat it and spread it. Now the season is just a little bit longer. Some plants are ripening fr fruit, birds are collecting them and throwing them into the forest. So in North Jersey, you could see individual little spots in the middle of the woods that they clearly came up from seed. Um, in South Jersey, moving through Central Jersey, you could see entire forest floors covered with them. Why now after 200 years of being introduced? Um, so it, I could kind of, I, it seems to be that it is a climate thing. It is a matter of the season being a little bit longer so those fruit get ripe. Um, we talked about honeysuckle that's been around a long time. Wisteria seems also to be getting more aggressive. Um, it doesn't spread from seed quite as well as English ivy does. Um, I'm not sure how many times I see a population that started from seed as opposed to being, I can imagine that this was planted at some point and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but as it also seems to be much more aggressive than it used to. Again, back to the, that's stunning, stunningly beautiful plant. There is an American wisteria. I've never grown it. I don't know if anyone ever has, but um, there is a native option. Mile a minute, you can stop an annual. That's one thing I've learned. Annuals spread very, very well by design. It is hard to stop them. Uh, bittersweet's been around a reasonably long time in the relative sense. Um, pretty horrendous invader. Porcelain berry seems to be another climate response kind of thing going on. 25, 30 years ago, it wasn't prevalent at all. Now, I mean, it is one of the most aggressive vines. It's like akin to kudzu. It will coat every single thing. So porcelain berry seems that it's gotten more aggressive and spreading better um, over more recent decades. <clears throat> Winter creeper, you know, another one that's sort of in that English ivy class, it will go all the way up trees. It is the most, one of the most fascinating plants that I know of. I've seen individuals, shrubby on one side, viney on the other, same individual. Crazy plant, love, gotta respect that. That is freaking awesome. Um, but it is also super invasive in every one I find I kill. Um, so yeah, I can separate those two parts of my mind. Um, but yeah, th this is a very popular, it's a great plant. I mean, I can see why it's popular. Um, but it is absolutely getting into nature areas and it, and it looks like this in multiple places in New Jersey. You know, there are native, uh, non-native Chinese silver grass has been reported in the flora for some time, at least through the eighties, if not before, um, but it has definitely become much more aggressive in more recent years. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, I don't know if anyone can know, but, you know, is it because climate is more suitable or was a variety of it introduced that's just more aggressive at spreading? I mean, that, that's, the, that's another potential viable option, a logical option. Um, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I just know that it's becoming very invasive. And, you know, this next to a mailbox is like one of the most <laughs> typical scenes that you'll see. Um, 
and it's it's cool it's a cool plant it's tall it stays upright it doesn't flop over every time it rains and things like that it's really hard to imagine a native that's that would do exactly that but you can get shorter natives that could do things like that like maybe uh um wool rush or something like that you know there, there might be natives that you could use They're, you're not going to get this exact thing and, that, and that's the sort of I, I look at it as almost a trap when people say well what's the native alternative and then and you're like and then you start like making things up and exaggerating like no there is no native alternative to that that's that's really freaking cool that's a neat looking plant but there is no native alternative so you could decide that you have to have that or you get a native grass that might be smaller in stature so that it's neater. You know, I almost killed my wife and I because I planted Indian grass right along my driveway that has a, a rise and a turn as you come up so you can't see each other. And then it would lean over four feet into my six foot wide driveway and we almost crashed into each other. And I'm like, I need to move that. I got to get rid of that Indian <laughs> grass. <laughs> You know, we almost had a double claim for we hit each other in the driveway. How, how would that be fun to tell your insurance company? Um, so, yeah, so I, I, you know, you could want something to be true and it's just never going to be, you know. So I love Indian grass, but I don't put it along my driveway anymore. Um, and I'm not going to plant that. So, you know, I have different plants now. Um, garlic mustard is... One of the older invasives, but um, and very edible. You can make a nice pesto out of it. Not weed. They released um, a biological control agent trial a year or two ago. We'll see if it works because without it, we're done. This is a really hard plant to kill. If there's no biological control, we ain't getting anywhere serious. Um, still grass. People say, how do you kill still grass? I say, get rid of deer. If you have a forest, these pictures aren't that great. Can I have a better one? Yeah, at least I have a better one. Anyway, um, when you have a tree canopy and nothing else because the deer have removed everything, still grass does great. When you have a forest canopy and a native shrub layer, still grass does not do great. You don't get a carpet of it anymore. If you, if you have two layers of shade, that's how you get rid of still grass. Um, you're not really going to chemical control your way out of a still grass problem. Mugwort seems to be getting more and more aggressive and showing up in more places. And uh, that's all the happy news I have. Um, you know, again, if, if I, you know, one of the things that's important for the strike team is, is sort of outreach and being there. If people have any questions that pop in your head a week, a month, a year from now, just reach out to me. Um, I, I get questions on, on email all the time. Can you share any lesser sounding? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really hard one. Um, typically, it's been associated with stream sides. So if, if you are downstream from something, some of source, and you kill all your stuff down here, it's going to keep reinfecting it from upstream. Those little tubers and seeds or whatever will come in the water and reinfest you. So if you did treat it, you would probably do it like late February, early March, when nothing else is out to get hit by your herbicide. Um, but it is a tough problem, and a streamside population, you know, it, it's um, it's a bit of a lost cause because it'll keep getting infected from upstream. Now, what I've been seeing is from down from stream side, it's getting into forests and doing well on drier soils. You know, one strategy we have, uh, one of our preserves, we have a bunch of rare plants and it's, it's starting to spread throughout the entire forest. So our strategy is a fallback, is the trail goes like this, the rare stuff's on this side, we are basically gonna go out every spring and make sure that it doesn't cross the trail. And that's all we can do. How would you treat it? Yeah, glyphosate. You might spray it. Yeah, yeah. And they have tubers. They have like a tuber bank, and I assume a seed bank as well. 
they're brutal. They're really brutal. Um, it's kind of like some of other species where you spray it one year and you're sure that it didn't go to seed or anything. And you have to do that two or three times before you even notice an impact because it's constantly replacing itself from the soil. So it's, it's a tough one. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I fear it's going to be more like a still grass situation where it's like, what do I do? <laughs> you know, um, you know, and that, that gets back into the herbicide question as well. Like, when do you use it? You use it when it's going to work. And for most cases with something like still grass or celandine or some others, it's not going to work. So maybe that's not the thing to spend your time on. Maybe there's other species to worry about. Um, you know, you could plant over it, you know, plant shrubs. Obviously the plant's only this tall. So it'll, it might keep some seeds from germinating. But, you know, again, there's only certain things you can do something about and some things you can't do anything about. So we do have uh, just a few comments from, uh, from Zoom. Um, so first, uh, our executive director, Steve, um, wanted to know how nonprofits like Flat Rock utilize the services of the invasive strike team. Um, so obviously there's a lot, there's free resources that we put out and, you know, the question and answer kind of stuff anytime. Um, we do contract, um, work fairly close to capacity right now. Um, uh, Beth, who's our senior land steward that runs all of the nuts and bolts of getting things done is, I'm sure she would say we're beyond our capacity. <laughs> <laughs> for the guy who sits at his desk most of the time, I'm like, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> um, the, um, but yeah, we've, we've been hired for contract by different groups. Um, and usually we set our contracts for the year in, in no later than January, because we need to know how many interns to hire and all that other stuff. But, you know, there's capacity issues. And one of the things we are looking at is, and it, it again, there's only so much time in the day is, is kind of like having either satellite strike teams or just training. What's that? Like other chapters. Yeah, or, or yeah, regions or stuff. Because yeah. what happens is we come from Hopewell. And if we, we came here, you would have five people in a truck and it would take them two hours to get here and two hours to get home. So you'd be paying five times four hours for transport time because I have to pay them even when they're driving. They're funny that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there, there's logistical. I've been, and I've, I haven't tried super hard, but my hope is to actually have regional hubs that either do their own thing or are part of the strike team in some way. Like we could train their interns and then they can go to wherever under whoever's banner they want, you know, but we could train them, you know, or so there's, there's different possibilities out there. I mean, I could be as creative as anyone wants to be to try to figure something out. Um, but we are for hire, but there's, that's one example of a limitation is travel time. Um, and we also had somebody who needed to leave a little early, but they said, thank you, a very pleasant presentation. And if anyone else online has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if I wanted to get involved with this, yep. volunteer, okay. uh, how would I do it? When would I do it? Um, so there are, there, when, when, um, I mean, probably the best thing to do is to tie yourself to a group that's as close to you as you can. Well, that's what I would try to do. Um, you know, there are some people that just sort of like want to do their own thing. And I'll say, OK, well, we have this phone app and you live in Bergen County. And I, I think and I say, you know what, what do we want to know about species in Bergen County? And I say, OK, learn these five or 10 species and go to every natural area you can in Bergen County and record all the ones you see. So I, I've done that with volunteers um, linking up to one of the volunteer stewardship teams linking up to a place like this, well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm yeah. a land steward here, and so yeah. if you ever want to come and 
you know, we absolutely welcome. Yeah, but I have to know something before I we can do teach. something. Yeah, we can teach you. You so, can teach yeah. me. Yeah. And I, I have volunteered with you before to, to go out and dig things in the woods. Right. Uh, sure so I would love to. There you go. I mean, the, the, the logistics part of it is the most important part, you know, so that that's where I, when, I, when people call me, I'm like, where in the state do you live? And I try to find a volunteer team or a, or a nonprofit that they could link to because that's the most likely chance that they're going to keep volunteering, not if they have to drive an hour and a half to get somewhere every time. I just was volunteering. Okay, there you go. You're set. Um, Done. I have a comment on herbicides. Yes. My undergraduate degree was chemistry. Okay. Okay, and I've worked in that area as a chemical company okay. all my life. Mm -hmm. All my working life. Now I'm old man. And it's but uh, I can guarantee you that every company that makes a herbicide has tested for safety, safety, and safety. The FDA gets a 